Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Cameron Guerra, an engineer here at IT Pro TV. With me today is Taylor Fossack, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me today, Taylor. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, Cam. Also excited because we have not one, but two special guests with us today. Woo! We've got Michael Lachard and Brian Hurt, both from Chat Wisely. Thanks for joining us today, Michael and Brian. Good to thanks. be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So, uh, Michael, you are the CEO of Chat Wisely. Could you get us acquainted? What is Chat Wisely? And I guess first, who are you? Tell us about yourself. Oh, sure. Um, uh, 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 I am uh, a software engineer uh, that uh, uh, met Brian uh, when we were working um, uh, at a different uh, company that was also uh, uh, using uh, Haskell, um, and that's where we got the uh, idea uh, for Chat Wisely. Well, that's where I uh, was enamored with Brian's idea um, uh, uh, for Chat Wisely, uh, uh, which is a, a member-supported mini blog um, uh, social network uh, that's currently in open beta. Okay, and mini blog social network is that something like Twitter, Mastodon, that type of thing? Oh yeah. Um, well, it's uh, 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 something like Twitter, uh, except uh, one of the main differences is how we handle uh, uh, the post chain. Um, with Twitter, uh, uh, we see a, a, a particular problem with Twitter is is being able to follow and manage um, extended conversations. Uh, so uh, the idea we came up with uh, was uh, to um, be able to uh, open up uh, 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 larger posts um, hidden behind smaller posts that look like Twitter, like look like uh, those Twitter um, uh, tweets. Okay. Uh, and the other ahead, big, uh, sorry, the other big thing, and probably even more importantly, is how we're actually going to fund it. Um, our plan is rather than depending depending upon advertising revenue, we're just going to charge a small amount, a buck a month basically nothing mm -hmm. but that's enough that it changes all of the incentives that the company has and you tell me how you tell me what incentives the company has you tell me how the company makes money i will tell you how the company will behave yeah. right and so this has been something i've been sort of muttering in my cups about for a couple of years <laughs> now that you know the problem with facebook and twitter and all of the spying and the trolls and everything has been because their business model is wrong mm -hmm. fix the business model and the behavior of the company fixes itself yeah and, and so i i met michael and i was you know uh um muttering in my cups one day and he was like sounds like a great idea let's do it <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so it sounds here we are. like a great idea to me as well mm-hmm yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Brian, could you give us uh, just a brief introduction to the technical side of things as well? Okay, I'm Brian Hurt. I'm the CTO of uh, Chat Wisely because I won the coin flip and so I got to <laughs> um, And yeah, Chat Wisely is uh, built in Haskell. Uh, we're using Haskell on the back end. Um, a lot of servants, some yay sewed, some more, you know, more yay sewed will be coming. Um, and uh, Postgres as the database, and GHCJS and Reflex as the front end, and we are loving Haskell. Um, I should hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, would you guys kind of expand upon your experience with GHCJS and kind of why you chose it? So, you know what? You know the the, the question is always, what's the right tool for the job? And mm -hmm. the you know the engineering is always about trade-offs. What do you gain? What do you lose? There is no such thing as a perfect solution. Um, right. And so, if you're going to do a more static web website, I would I would probably recommend Yasode as the website generator. Really like it for you know static server-side rendering. Mm -hmm. But you know if you need the dynamism of the the front end you know, complex, you know, dynamic changing uh, of mm -hmm. web app, um, then, 
GHCJS and um, Reflex are good solutions. Um, right. Nice. And it, I mean, there there are solid business reasons to choose uh, JHCJS and Reflex as opposed to say Node.js um, when you're two guys and your labor your labor budget is zero, <laughs> um, uh, uh, and you need to iterate quickly, and you're building something that you don't know how to. I mean, this is we started not knowing how to build a social network. Um, right. uh, and, um, it was, uh, uh, the, uh, type system of Haskell, um, that, uh, allowed us to, um, get stuff out quickly, figure out, uh, where, you know, the happy path was, um, cheaply. Um, and we right. don't spend a lot of time, um, on, on unit tests, um, but rather, um, you know, getting, getting the product out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's this is where Haskell really shines uh, from a business perspective. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would go. You are, if you're not using Haskell in the back end, at least you are almost certainly messing up. Um, <laughs> it is Haskell in the back end is such a strong proposition. Um, the advantage of doing Haskell on the front end and doing GHCJS, the biggest advantage is you can share code between the front end and the back end. Right. And so what happens, and I've seen this at other, you know, at, at, at other places I've worked, is, you, you know, you, you, you get a, if you're using Haskell on both front end and back end, you, drive, you, you take a feature and you drive it home, soup to nuts, right? You do the back mm -hmm. end, you do the front end, you do the database, you do, you know, um, you everything. do everything, and then you go, here, it's done. In other environments that I've worked in, you know, when you have different languages it, you know, in the front end versus the back end, it sorts out that there will be front end people and there will be back end people. And what will happen is the back end people will, enter, you know, will, will implement you know, stuff for this feature, and the front end people will go, well, we're not, you know, the back end isn't there yet. We can't start developing until the front, the, the back end is there, and then they'll mm -hmm. forget about it. And then, I'm not kidding. I actually have experiences of five years later, management's going, "Whatever happened to this feature that like we, <laughs> we did work on like five years ago?" What? The back end people are like, "It's there. It works." And the front end people are going, "What feature?" Or mm -hmm. vice versa. I've seen it go the other way. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, this is, you know. This is just yeah. how humans work. Once you start se seg segregating into two groups, it becomes the sharks and the jets, whether you want it to be or not, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so just, just being able to go, okay, you are in charge of this feature, soup to nuts, do it, mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. it gets done and you don't have all of this stuff hanging fire and handoff issues and so on. Um, right. And yeah. there's, there's a huge advantage to, I mean, one of the biggest pieces of code that gets shared between the front end and the back end are, is the types of the data you're, 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 you're sending back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very nice to just go, you know, we have a common schema directory that has all of the, the common directory is everything that's shared between the front end and the back end. And the mm -hmm. schema is just all of those data types that are both the front end and the back end have. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, here's the two, you know, this is the type, here's the two JSON, here's the from JSON, do the obvious quick check test to go, if we encode it to JSON and decode it, we should get the same thing back out again. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you don't have a communications problem of, you know, of, of the back end sending one thing and the front end expecting something else. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's yeah, a, we. We are currently in that situation you were describing where uh, Cam and I both primarily work on the back end and we are using Haskell, so we're doing something right there. And our API is in Servant, so we have uh, you know a, a well-typed description of it. And on the front end, we're using Elm rather than uh, GHCJS, but the, the principle is the same. You know, We're using a, a strongly yeah. typed front end language, so we have to decode it. And yeah, we have walked into that situation a couple of times where the back end team has developed something and then the front end team doesn't know that it's finished. They think they're still waiting on it or vice versa. And uh, it would be nice to be able to go end to end with one language. Um, but I am curious, uh, is there a particular reason y'all chose GHCJS versus, uh, you know, there are many languages in here like uh, Elm or PureScript or Haste or Fay or whatever. 
Sorry, uh, Tim, you got something? A lot of it was... Yeah. A, a lot of it was just straight up familiarity. Both of us okay. had worked with GHCJS and Reflex mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. and nice. so um, I will admit to a little bit of pure script envy. Um, <laughs> there are, but there are trade offs here, right? It, it's always, mm -hmm. you know, what do you gain? What do you lose? Um, mm -hmm. I had some experience and, with pure script, and my pro only problem with pure script, besides the fact that you cannot share. Uh, uh, data types is that it's just like Haskell until it isn't. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, getting getting tripped up over that just just there's there's too much friction, um, and and what you get in exchange just didn't seem uh, worth it. And not knowing how to build what we were going to build, um, uh, I, I found that Reflex would give us the flexibility to change course if we needed to, and we have needed to on a number of occasions. Yeah, or the reflexibility, um, you might say. Yeah, I mean, for for me, it the idea of the shared data types between the front end and the back end is just awesome because we've had kind of that issue where, you know, for generically deriving something, we change the name of a record accessor and then, oh, the front end's broken or mm -hmm. a mobile app was broken for two months. We had no idea, you know, like those kind of things, <clears throat> you know, also, obviously, there's test cases for that kind of stuff, and we were have learned from our mistakes. But you know, it's kind of that thing where if we could just have the same data types front and back end, it's not you know we don't have to worry about decoding and encoding changes that would break you know production running right. sites. Yeah, and I'm curious for y'all. Uh, maybe Chat Wisely hasn't been around long enough to have run into this problem, but maybe y'all are familiar with it. So even with code sharing. Do you still worry about, is there like an older version of the client out there that expects the old schema? And we updated it and it's new on the back end and new on the front end, but they haven't refreshed the page yet. Um, Brian um, came up with a great idea very early on to deal with this. Let's hear it. <laughs> okay, so the basic idea is you need to have versioned schemas. Um, mm -hmm. the, the nice thing, uh, one of the nice things about Servant, one of the many, many nice things about Servant is, you know, you sit there and you go, this endpoint has a function, here's the function. Mm -hmm. So you can have multiple different, you can have, you know, V1 schema and V2 schema and, you know, V3 schema. And if the function, if that endpoint hasn't changed, you just use the same function in all three places. Mm -hmm. And so our plan for doing that is you just support multiple versions of the schema. Um, you know, at the same time, and it's, okay, these endpoints are different, and here is the old endpoint that supports the old schema, and here is the new endpoint that supports the new schema, and mm -hmm. then you can still have old clients using the old, the, 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 the old API, and you can have, but you can still move forward. Yeah, that's very slick. And, um, and we're doing something similar to that on on the database, right? You have this, you have sort of the same problem on the database side of things, right? Where you want to be changing the database schema, um, mm -hmm. and don't get me started on schema list. We only have an hour here. <laughs> just, um, <laughs> just walk walk quietly past and let's move mm -hmm. on. Um, you want to change the database schema, but you've got some servers that are using the old schema and some servers that are using the new schema. Yeah, and so the solution is, um, you 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 basically code it so that we're using Liquibase, and there's a specific table that Liquibase updates to to go. These are the constraints. Uh, these these are the the schema changes that are in in place, mm -hmm. and you can write your code so that you know the nice thing about Postgres is the schema changes are are uh, um, um, atomic are are transactional so yeah. you're either on the old schema or you're on the new schema and you don't have to worry about what if I'm halfway in between you can just go mm -hmm. has this change been applied yet and you can write what you do is you write your server stage one you write your server to go it supports both the old schema and the new schema and it just goes, you know, hit, hit, when it hits the database, it goes, you know, starts a transaction. It goes, okay, which schema do I have? Do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Then once, then you do a blue-green deployment to update everything. So now everything supports both the old schema and the new schema. Yep. You do the database transaction to implement the new schema. 
once that commits, every all all of the you know all of the um um all of the web servers switch over to using the new schema, and then when when it's convenient, you delete the support the old schema code, allowing you to simplify your code, and then mm -hmm. the next time you do a blue green deployment, you don't have to do it immediately, but as you know as you bring up new servers anyways, you bring them up with I I just only support the new schema. Yeah, I love it. And Seamless. So, Yep, and so this allows you to be updating the, um, you know, updating the database even while you're live and serving traffic. Mm -hmm. and I'm curious. Uh, it sounds like you're doing either something very similar or the same on the front end. Is there a cutoff point for you on the front end? Like, we we will support clients that are up to you know a week old or a month old or whatever. Um, we haven't made that decision yet. Um. There, there's a couple of different solutions to that, um, mm -hmm. ranging from nice to obnoxious. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I've seen nice... some uh, single page apps where they'll have a little pop up that says, hey, there's been an update, please refresh. And I yep. assume at a certain point they get a little uh, more strongly worded than that. Yeah. <laughs> and you can start doing stunts like, okay, everybody using the old schema now has an additional one second delay added to all Ooh. of their rest calls. <laughs> uh, That's devious. Oh, you have a program uh, performance problem. Have you tried updating? Oh, it's all <laughs> fast now. Okay, problem solved. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's like the the iPhone world where they you know, slow down the thing so you get a new phone. Right. Yep. The planned so. obsolescence approach to client upgrades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not saying we're going to do that. We actually we haven't gotten to the point where we've needed to do this stuff, but mm -hmm. my pieces are in position and I'm ready to. I know uh, know how we're going to solve that problem. Gonna put them in checkmate, huh? <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um, so uh, GHCJS obviously works great for the web. Do you have a story for? Or have you thought about uh, native clients, and are you going to use Haskell there as well? Okay. Yes. The short answer, yes, we have a story, and yes, we're going to use Haskell there, at least at the beginning. So no, one of the surprised. other nice things about Reflex, well, GHCJS in general, is you can flip and do compile to native iOS and native Android um, using, you know, just using a built-in browser, using the native mode browser stuff. Okay, um, yeah, so like a web view or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um and so you can just take your reflex code and compile it to iOS native or Android native and go bang here here's your web app and that gets is uh, that's a get you started solution right that isn't a right. long term you're going to you know if if chat wisely takes off and we start having you know millions of users and money to actually spend um we will almost certainly be you know you know evolve um, native, true native front ends written in Swift or Kotlin or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Although well, by possibly, that time, possibly GHC, right? It might be worthwhile to just spend the time to do the bindings to the native to the native calls to the native libraries and just write the code in GHC. Exactly. Um, I was going to say that with the recent changes to the Apple Silicon using um, you know ARM as their. Yep. Uh, platform of choice, I think GHC in 9.2 is going to have support for that. And I know it's not the exact same, but that should perhaps ease the transition into iOS native and maybe Android native. Yeah. Um, but but we can get a long ways just going, here is the web native, you know, the, 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 you know, the web native implementation. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, because I, I mean, like, Slack did that for years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Slack got got away with that for many years, which was which is what I needed to be assuaged. I was a little nervous about this, but then, you know, um, we saw the Slack business case, and they did it for years. I think we'll we'll be fine. You know. Yeah, if Slack mm -hmm. can get away with it, why not? <laughs> exactly. <else>? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, it, so yeah, I'm yeah. curious. Uh, GHCJS seems like it has been going like gangbusters and you've got plans for future improvements. Is there anything about it that you haven't liked or hasn't been great? Uh, I will say there's, there are some performance problems, which is what's causing the sort of the, 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 um, the, 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 the pure script envy a little bit there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, although 
you know, from what you guys are saying, I, I think I would take the fewer problems, slower code. Um, <laughs> I am a firm believer of I would rather have slow but correct code than fast but wrong code. Yeah, I, I, I think can, it's a little easier to speed things up than it is to make them more correct. Usually, yeah. in painting, painting with some broad strokes here, but... Um, no. And for the performance problems, are you talking about like uh, bundle size or like actual runtime performance? Um, bundle size is a problem. Um, actual runtime. So the problem, as I understand it, and I am not an expert, takes this don't don't take this with so much a grain of salt as a five pound block of salt. Um, <laughs> is um, the 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 you know the um, uh, the garbage collector. In, in Haskell will actually force thunks. Um, okay. As how it's been explained to me. Um, so like if you have a if you have a thunk that produces a tuple and then another thunk that just calls first on the tuple, the garbage collection will notice that the tuple thunk has been forced and will just automatically force the first thunk, right? To mm -hmm. just and, and that will oftentimes free up a lot of memory. And this okay. is a huge performance requirement in Haskell. The the story I got told was recompiling GHC with this trick in the garbage collector takes like, you know, 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. Without this trick, they let it run for 24 hours and it hadn't completed yet before they <laughs> killed it. It's it's that gotcha. sort of performance. Couple orders of magnitude. Um, um, and so, again, large chunk of salt here. Um, but... <laughs> This means this means two things. One thing is the 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 the, the uh, JavaScript size is much larger than it needs to be because you're converting to JavaScript from the wrong point. You have mm -hmm. to be converting it to down at I think the C minus minus level rather than at the core level. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be much smaller and actually much nicer on, on JavaScript if we could go straight from core to, to JavaScript. Um, and so, you know, now where the other thing is, is that now you have to have a garbage collector in your garbage collector language. Right. Which is just never a win. <laughs> you got a runtime on top of your runtime. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's it's I think it's good enough, um, but I actually have the dream of you know one day having enough money to actually hire people to fix this, mm -hmm. and I actually think the the this is this is me dreaming the 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 shining city in the distance sort of uh, dream. I actually think Haskell compiling to JavaScript could be faster than native JavaScript. Uh, 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 um, um, frameworks like like um, like React, mm -hmm. and here here is my reasoning, and this isn't true at the moment, you know. But what could be? Um, so with React, how things work is when any when when any when in, blah, 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 let me try this again <laughs> in English. When any time when anything changes, you re draw the entire. Um, you you re-render the entire the, the entire page, yeah. But you re-render mm -hmm. it in virtual DOM, not real DOM objects, because mm -hmm. constructing real DOM objects is expensive. And then you diff this tree, the, this virtual DOM tree with with the DOM that actually exists, and then you do whatever changes actually changed, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But this means you're doing an awful lot of work. You're generating an awful lot of objects and then you're having to do a large diff to go, okay, this button changed from red to green. <laughs> what happens in Reflex in GHCJS is you just hit the DOM directly. You don't recreate the DOM. You just go, this DOM now has style. Instead of having a style color red, it has a style color green. Bang. Mm -hmm. And this is a much faster update. You know, you're, you're, even if you're slower, even if your performance on average is slower, you're doing so much less work that it could still be a win. Right. Yeah. And I want to 
reiterate, this is not how things actually exist at the moment. So everybody going, oh, I tested it and that's not how it works. I'm going, yes, <laughs> yeah, this yes, is I how know. things could be. This is how um, it could mm -hmm. be. I think Elm is perhaps proof positive that that approach can work. Uh, as far as I understand it, Elm um, can perform better than, say, React because it has immutable data structures. It doesn't have laziness. Yep. However, their uh, HTML generator can be written in a lazy way. They, they have a strict one and they have a lazy one. Um, and they also have a keyed version, which I think React has as well. But yeah, it's um, it, it can have that same performance guarantee where it doesn't need to realize the entire virtual DOM in order to notice that this one node changed. It can do much less work. And because of that and many other reasons, I think it can be faster. Yep. Well, that's exciting. Um, so I see you've taken the, uh, the downside of GHCS and turned it into a potential future upside. <laughs> yeah, but again, it's, it's, it's welcome to engineering. It's what do you gain, what do you lose? There are no perfect solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And the upsides of, um, well, I also really like the, 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 um, um, the uh, um, having a senior moment. Reactive banana, Michael. The uh... oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called reactive banana. That was my first um, uh, introduction to um, uh, functional reactive programming. Functional uh, reactive yeah. programming was the phrase I just you know couldn't remember. <laughs> it yeah, first the knees go, then the memory goes, and then I forget what goes after that. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I really like functional reactive programming just as a programming style. It, maybe it's just how my brain is wired, but I I, I like just wire everything up. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then, uh, for listeners who may not be familiar with FRP, my understanding of it is that it is more event driven than um, like state driven. But I haven't actually used FRP in anger, so maybe Brian, could you explain what it means to you? Okay, so. The core of FRP is actually fairly simple. Um, you you got you've got you've got three three parts three three major parts. You get what I think of as the FRP the the the, the, the FRP pure stuff. You've got the um, um, the DOM generating stuff, and then you have the interfa in, interfacing functions. So at the FRP level, you have events. An event is something that can be firing at any given point in time, and it can be carrying a value when it fires. So a cl classic examples are a key press, right? And it's carrying mm -hmm. what the event is, what key got pressed, or a mouse clicked, right? Right. Um, then you have behaviors. Um, behaviors are things that have a value at all points in time. At any point in time, I can sit there and I can go, behavior, what's your value? Mm -hmm. Like, especially this event fired, when this event fires, get the, beha get the value out of that behavior and, you know, go do something with it. And then mm -hmm. you have dynamics, which are the combination of, beha uh, uh, it's a behavior and an event that fires whenever the behavior changes. Okay. So this is, this is sort of the, the pure and, you know, you know, behaviors, you can F map behaviors, you can filter behaviors, you, uh, uh, you know, you can, um, Sorry, you can't filter behaviors. You can F map everything. Everything's a functor. Uh, dynamics are monads. Um, you can do filters on the events, right? So this event mm -hmm. fired, is it the one I care about? No, don't fire, you know, don't carry on firing. Right. The, then you have a standard monadic based DOM generation, right? Where I can just, send, you know, there's an EL function which creates a DOM element. And mm -hmm. you can give it. This is you know. This is the tag. Here are the attributes, and here is the 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 monad that generates its children, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm generated as some children of some parent function, right? So this ends up. This code ends up looking an awful lot like if you've ever if you've ever done um, Blaze HTML or um, um, Lucid. Lucid. Um, it, it ends up looking very similar to that. I mean, the yeah. functions are all named differently because, of course, they are. But um, it, it's very much that pattern. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the interface functions, right? So there's a function that can take an element that you generated and go, when, when, when the user clicks on it, you know, give me an event that fires when the user clicks on this element. Right. So that's or, your binding back into the FRP system. Yeah. Or... Right. 
create this element and here is an event or dynamic that holds the attributes that this, this element should have, right? And when, mm -hmm. this, when the dynamic updates and changes, the attributes get reset. Or here is you know, a widget hold. Here is, you know, I just want to swap out which monad I'm sticking in, you know, to generate the DOM in this place to replace this whole DOM subtree with some other DOM subtree, you know, coming out of a dynamic or an event, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so to, to me, this all sounds eerily similar to the architecture Elm has tried to do. So I know that we kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, so it's relating a lot to me as far as like my experience yeah. with Elm and like, yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, like this makes sense. And I do enjoy that style yeah. very yeah. much. Elm, I think, used to be uh, based on FRP, but sometime, I want to say like Elm.16, they are no longer FRP based, even though the, the interface you use is very similar. Mm -hmm. So just um. historical oddity there. Yeah, I think they you know, they may they may still qualify as, as FRP in my my book. Um, I haven't actually done a lot of Elm, so. Um, but if if they are FRP, I mean that in a good sense. I like that's a good <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, so uh, switching gears just a little bit, uh, y'all mentioned that the back end is kind of a mix of servant and Yasod. Is that yep. correct? Yep. So. Uh, do you do any server-side rendering, uh, like a pre-baked version of the single page app to send out the first load that then gets updated later? Or how does that work? Um, okay, we don't, okay, we're using, again, I'm a great believer in using the right tool for the job. And mm -hmm. for stuff that doesn't have a, a reflex, um, uh, 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 a reflex front end that's needed, um, we are using a sode and one of the nice things about haskell is haskell works well with haskell you can have you know you write a little bit of web application interface code and by a little bit i mean like five lines ten lines yeah. of it and you go okay the a sode stuff goes here and the reflex stuff goes there and everything's just happy and it all just works beautifully and so you can sit there and you can go okay there are there are some web pages like you know give us your financial information where we don't want you know we want it to be a server side rendered you know right uh, you a want web as page. little javascript on there as possible a little job yeah and and you know all of the you know stuff to make sure that people aren't hijacking the session and all of that yeah. which yesod all has and baked in um so use yesod for what yesod's really good at and mm -hmm. by the way, if, if, if that's pretty much your entire web page, I do recommend Yesod. It is a very nice, if, if, if you, you know, if you are, if you are just a static web page generating site, um, you know, Yesod is very, very nice. I like, I like its widget idea. Um, mm -hmm. But for the, you know, for the reflex pages, we haven't implemented this yet and we are going to in the near future. And it's, you know, it's, simply a complete deficit of circular to it. Um, we don't have any round to it. Um, haven't gotten any round to it yet. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we have, you know, um, uh, Reflex has a, um, a, a, a static rendering where you basically run the Reflex code Again, this is the nice thing. You can share code between front end and back end, right? Right. So we can just mm -hmm. suck the suck the page rendering code from the client into the server side mm -hmm. and go when you are hitting a, a, a reflex page, we just pre-render the page on the server side using exactly the same code and spit that up and then and then reflex has some some magic it does to to instead of generating the DOM reuse the existing dom right kind of bootstrap it yeah okay and so, so then this is this is possible in theory it's just not done yet um we haven't done it yet we haven't done it yeah. at chat wisely yet um i've done gotcha. it at other places just round to its deficit um, cool that's very exciting so hopefully that will solve several of our bigger performance problems mm -hmm. um so we've been talking tech for a while now, but when we kicked this off, we were talking a little about, um, you know, the users of the site and how it's funded. And I want to come back to that. So, uh, Michael, could you uh, maybe talk us through a little more about 
uh, the funding, like you mentioned, it's going to be, I think right now in an open beta and mm -hmm. you will charge users some fees, sounds like a dollar a month. Mm -hmm. um, how does this compare to other sites with a similar model? Uh, ones I'm familiar with are like Metafilter or Slashdot or Fark or something awful, I think, where um, this is just like a minimum bar to clear in order to participate. Uh, you have to throw a dollar at us or $5 or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, what do you expect, what impact do you expect that to have on the community? Uh, well, I think the um, uh, 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 biggest uh, uh, impact it's gonna have is that it's our first troll filter. Mm -hmm. um, we don't think most uh, bad actors are gonna want to pay for the privilege. Right. Um, and uh, the feedback I've been getting when I talk to people um, and make the pitch, it's going to be a dollar a month. The the uh, re uh, reaction I get is, "Oh, that's nothing," which is what we want to communicate to you. It's nothing, but in the aggregate to us, it's a sustainable business. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 whether you're charging a dollar a month or not, every social network needs to reach um, uh, uh, a point of stability um, uh, to have a, a strong enough strongly connected enough and large enough network um, mm -hmm. in order to be considered stable. So it's in that scenario, um, chat wisely having reached stability um, that uh, uh, that dollar a month um, is, is, is very much worth it. Um, and so, yeah, so the, 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 the dollar a month is our first, um, uh, 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 not just our uh, first filter, um, but also allows us to deliver uh, features that we've noticed um, would be popular, have been popular, um, but they don't work in um, uh, at, at, uh, social networks that rely on ads. Um, I'll give you an okay. example. Um, there was a few years back in 2014, uh, uh, a social network called Yik Yak. Um, Yik Yak was uh, geolocated uh, based messaging, um, <laughs> which blew up on college campuses. College kids loved Yik Yak. The problem was, is that everyone was anonymous um, and people could come and go anonymously, um, which meant Yik Yak turned into a harassment machine. Um, and yeah, they, uh, they they shut down as fast as they blew up. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 so um, the, 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 need, the market is there, um, uh, uh, just for that one aspect as an example. Um, mm -hmm. where we come in, um, uh, and the way, the reason why we think we could make that scenario work, um, in a post COVID world, of course, um, right. is, uh, 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 having paid us, even though we provide mechanisms, um, to protect your privacy to the outside world, if that's what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 so you, you can go ahead and be, uh, anonymous to the outside world, but we know who you are. Um, and so uh, that is a huge disincentive um, to try and use chat wisely as a harassment machine. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 so I think that's going to be a huge impact. We, we, uh, we're going to be able to offer um, uh, features that people want um, but cannot work um, in uh, uh, an ad-based uh, uh, social network. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. Can I, the uh, I, kind of localized or uh, I guess hyper local would be the buzzword version of that. Um, I can see that it is an appealing feature and uh, Yik Yak, I suppose, is proof positive of that. Um, and yeah, it would be it'd be cool to see that in a platform that isn't ad driven. Yeah. And uh, can I jump in here for a minute? Yes, oh, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, there are features that, you know, that make perfect sense for us, but don't for um, um, Facebook. And one big one is a lot more control over what what you see. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if you wrote a client for Facebook or for Twitter that showed all the content but didn't show the ads, they would have to shut you down quickly. Right. Um, just just to keep their own lights on, right? Just to you know to to pay their own salaries, they would have to shut you down quickly. Mm -hmm. We have no such problem. Um, you know, so long as you're paying us the buck a month, you know, we're we're good with however you want to access the site. Um, right. 
alternative only... clients are fine as long as the users are actually yep. paying for paying you for the service. Yep. And so, oh, and and you know, allow me to to circle back on the tech side of things. This is one of the nice things about Servant is we are planning at one point. We're not doing it currently, but at some point we will be going. Here's a library to access our, you know, our API with, you know, JavaScript, with Ruby, with Python, with Java, with whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, let a thousand clients, you know, you know, bloom. Exactly. And may the best one win. Hopefully, we're the best one. We'll be working hard <laughs> to make sure we we'll try to make sure we're the best one. But it's going to be a level playing field. We're not going to have access to super secret APIs that you know you don't. Right. Um, That's something that we have been able to take advantage of here at IT Pro. Like I mentioned, our back end team and front end team are separate, um, and we have an internal Swagger API. Uh, we haven't yet got to the point where we generate a client from that, but we do have the open API swagger specification that you can browse and, you know, make requests through and all that, uh, which turns out to be really handy because when we finish a feature, we can just send a link to that documentation to the front end team and say, Hey, here's the endpoint. It's got everything you need in there. Yep. Um, yeah. In so a previous... what... Oh, uh, no, I just wanted to talk about how we, um, organize. This is another thing that, um, uh, 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 Twitter and Facebook don't really want you to do because what they want to do is to deliver you an ad. Um, mm -hmm. and so their timeline belongs to them, not you. Your timeline belongs to them, not you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so with us, um, our incentives, uh, 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 have, we're, we're incentivized to, to want, to want people to, to own their timeline. Um, mm -hmm. and so what we've done is given ways to, uh, organize your timeline. Um, so that uh, you can divide uh, up the timeline based on who you're talking to and what you're talking about. So, right. for example, if you've got relatives that you want to engage with um, in terms of, you know, food recipes or sport events and things like that that are, you know, family safe, um, but not want to talk about politics so much, um, <laughs> uh, 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 the other... You know, other social networks are pretty binary. Either you're engaging these people or you aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with us, uh, we give much a much finer control. Maybe I want to talk to my um, uh, aunt about, you know, her cookie recipes, uh, but not so much about her um, opinion on national politics. And uh, we, we have mechanisms uh, 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 to help you do that. Sounds really <laughs> powerful. Like a hopefully better version of Google's uh, circles, which were person-based rather than kind of topic-based mm -hmm. from, from the uh, dark days of Google+. Plus. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys uh, coming onto the podcast. I, I want to let our audience know um, and let you guys kind of give them an update of kind of what's next and maybe some of your platforms that you're, uh, well, not some of your platforms, but where to find your platform and how to access it and how to, you know, be a part of it. Yeah. Oh, Chatwisely.com. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can come to chatwisely.com. And uh, uh, so what we're doing right now uh, is uh, uh, trying to demonstrate um, to uh, uh, to potential investors that uh, uh, our, our assertion is valid, that people are willing to pay. Um, but because we're beta, uh, we don't have our payment mechanisms uh, set up yet. Uh, so uh, in lieu of that, uh, we've set up a Patreon. Um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, has has astounded and 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 given me uh, lots of warm fuzzies uh, based on how successful we haven't had it up very uh, very long, um, and uh, uh, the success that we've achieved with that um, uh, is, is you know making me feel really good. Uh, uh, we're up to a little over a hundred a, mo a month on it, um, uh, uh, and um, the uh, higher we can get that number, um, the more powerful our assertion will be that people are willing um, uh, uh, to pay for a social network. Um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll leave a link both to chatwisely.com and to the Patreon in the show notes for this episode. Great. Uh, so thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, is there anything we didn't cover that y'all wanted to mention about Chatwisely? Um, well, uh, we need beta testers. Um, uh, uh, we, we've had some uh, 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 come on. Um, the uh, uh, the Yeso blog uh, was very uh, helpful for that. Um, and uh, 
uh, uh, uh, our, uh, we had we had some uh, uh, people point out uh, tests and or problems um, <laughs> and uh, generated some you know lots of tickets for us which is what we need um, yeah uh, uh, and so uh, yeah we, we we need beta testers we please try to break it try to break the site uh, if things are confusing <laughs> let us know um, we're not user interface or user experience people um, and so we need a conversation with beta testers um, about uh, their reaction to how we have things designed, which will help us iterate um, mm -hmm. and, and get something and get, and get a better user experience. Well, awesome. Yeah. I mean, thank you, Brian and Michael. It's been a lot of fun kind of hearing about chat wisely. Um, and I'm going to throw it over to our friend Taylor. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. And again, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Brian, for being guests today. It's been great to talk with you. Thank you for uh, having I've, us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've been your host, Taylor Fossack, and with me today was Cameron Guerra. If you want to find out more about Haskell Weekly, you can go to our website, which is haskellweekly.news. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please rate and review us wherever you found us. If you have any feedback for us, please hit us up on Twitter at Haskell Weekly. And uh, yeah, anything else, Cam? Yeah, and Haskell Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company, and our employer. They would like to offer you 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. So if you have any interest in IT world, we have the content for you. Um, and you can use promo code Haskell Weekly 30 at checkout for that discount. So I think that about does it for us. Thank you for joining us on the Haskell Weekly podcast, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Peace.